What's up YouTube, let's talk about compression today. So I want to cover a few aspects of compression. I want to look into the more sort of corrective style of compression, you know, using a compressor or dynamics processes to kind of fix what you think might be broken in your track or your mix. But I also want to chat a little bit about creative uh, dynamics processing, using particular compressors and com particular compressor setups for the characteristics which they impart on the sound. So I kind of want to split the two ideas entirely and I want to cover like corrective dynamics first because I feel like a lot of the time the terms are mixed up and I feel that corrective compression is so subtle that often guys apply techniques from you know the more creative approach to try and fix sounds and in turn imparting the characteristics of the compressor onto that sound and may compound the issue and end up making it worse. So I kind of want to split the two topics up, but that being said, let's dive into compression today. And first I want to dive into looking at uh, how to use compression to fix certain things. So the first thing I kind of want to get out of the way is I personally feel that compression isn't as important in mixing as equalizer. So EQ is the type of thing that I will have on almost every channel in my track. It is essential to, you know, carving a particular space in the mix. And there's actually a lot of different techniques that you can use in EQ4, most of which are pretty essential in music production, specifically electronic production and mixing. On the other hand, compressor is one of those tools where I feel you really need to know what you want to do with it before opening it up uh, to get the best results. This is obviously talking about the more corrective style, but I feel like it really helps to kind of know what you want to do to achieve the best results with the compressor. And I want to show you guys a couple of tricks to do so. So let's dive into this track that I'm working on and we can have a look at a couple of techniques and stuff. Okay, so before diving in with like techniques and a couple of tips and tricks and stuff like that, I want to cover a bit of theory about compression. I uh, kind of want to explain to you guys exactly what the parameters are doing um, and, you know, what a compressor attempts to do theoretically so you can better understand, you know, what's going on in the video and stuff like that. So, So let's say, for example, this is your audio file. Um, I'm just drawing the top half because that's all we really need to look at for this uh, sort of analysis. And it may not look like an audio file, so please just excuse my quick drawing skills. Um, so like I was saying, let's say, for example, this is our audio file. And um, as most of you guys probably know, this uh, sort of uh, upwards over here represents the amplitude in, let's say, dB. And this represents your time. So uh, let's just say milliseconds for now, um, just because that's generally how a uh, compressor's dials uh, read out. So in terms of the uh, parameters that you generally find on a compressor, the one of the most important is the threshold. And the threshold is generally read out in dBs. And what the threshold is, is whereabouts on this sort of X scale you want to set your sort of threshold. So what I'm going to do is, let's say, for example, this is minus 10 dB over here, and that's what you're going to set your threshold to on, on the compressor. So what we're essentially telling the compressor is to trigger whenever the sound goes past minus 10 dBs on the amplitude scale. The next setting you have is ratio. So what I'm going to actually do here is let's just say, I'm going to write this here so we don't forget, call this threshold. And the next important sort of parameter on a compressor is the ratio. So the ratio is usually in a uh, sort of multiple, like two to one, four to one, um, that kind of thing. And let me quickly explain what the ratio is doing. So let's say for example, kind of zoom in to this section over here. I'm gonna quickly redraw it on this side. So let's say for example, we set the ratio 
at 2 to 1. What that means is for every 1 dB that this signal peaks above the threshold, it's going to reduce the signal by 2 dBs. So what we're doing now is we're halving this peak over here and this peak over here. So essentially what we've done is, you know, we've set a point at which is kind of like a average point which we want to kind of use to reduce uh, peaks that are either too high or average out, you know, peaks that maybe are not peaking as high as some others in the mix. So for example, as you set the ratio higher, like four to one or eight to one, the amount that gets reduced per dB goes higher and higher, etc., etc., until you get to a point which is infinite to one, which generally speaking is what limiters work with. And that essentially doesn't let any sound past the threshold point. I hope that's making sense. So that's the ratio and the threshold. So then you've got the attack and release settings on the compressor. And what those represent is the amount of time that the compressor takes to reach that kind of full compression. So in examples where you've got a very sort of transient sound and you use a high attack setting, what's going to happen is the compression is only going to kind of dial in. Say for example, this is like five milliseconds or you know 10 milliseconds. This would be the kind of attack time over here. So essentially what we're doing is, you know, only this part of the sound will then start being compressed. You know, if the compressor has a hold time setting, that would be over here. Excuse my terrible handwriting. And then the release time would be over here. So obviously it's compounded with the waveform itself. And the result would be, you know, that transient peak would still hit through and then the body of the sound then gets reduced and the tail of the sound gets reduced depending on your kind of attack and release settings. So what a lot of people kind of confuse attack and release on compressors is that it's kind of the opposite to how you're working with a synth in the kind of sound design stage. You know, when you increase the attack of a amplitude envelope or a filter envelope, it generally results in less transient coming through. Whereas on a compressor, it's kind of the opposite way around, if that's a kind of easier way to understand it. So another thing to note is this will be happening, you know, on all of these kind of peaks that hit past that threshold. And, you know, depending on the amount of peak and the ratio settings, you're going to get a kind of varying response. Um, and that's why, you know, kind of if you're looking for something like a more kind of stable sound and you've got access to, you know, synthesizing stuff from the source, it may be better to go back there and, you know, use velocity and all sorts of other parameters to, you know, get this kind of desired effect. However, that being said, when you understand the fundamentals of a compressor, they can be used in the kind of sound design process as well. Then you've got the makeup gain, which I guess is pretty self-explanatory. All that does is is increase the overall signal or reduce it, uh, depending on, on, on how you've set it up, obviously. So essentially then what we're doing is we're kind of lowering these peaks, say something like that, and then increasing the overall volume of the sound. So now we're able to get, you know, a lot more presence, you know, in, in terms of like the amplitude of the sound over a long period of time without some of the peaks getting really loud and some of the peaks, you know, not getting loud enough and stuff like that. You're kind of using it to average out that kind of uh, amplitude over time. So yeah, I hope that helps understand the theory behind compression. So firstly, I want to cover using a compressor to create a more overall stable kind of bass sound or low end sound in your track. And this isn't particularly necessary for tracks that have a sort of single note rolling bass line. When if, I find when you start creating like variety with notes, you can get these kind of like jumpy grooves or rhythms, um, which may take away from the kind of stability of the overall track itself. 
So again, like I said, this is something that, you know, might not be necessary in all tracks, but I want to show you an example of this track with a straight rolling bass line and then when a kind of like varying bass kind of comes in. One thing to note though is I did record this bass line from a hardware analog synth, so there is a bit of oscillated drift and the phasing is not 100%, but I think that kind of helps to accentuate the kind of varying sound that I'm getting that I can show you guys, you know, how to best combat that with a compressor. So anyway, let me show you the example. So notice when this bass line with the kind of variety of notes comes in, you kind of lose that very stable low end effect that you've got in this uh, rolling bass section. What I actually want to do is I want to open up LFO tool and use this, uh, put it onto scope mode. And I've just basically, it's all defaulted. So there's nothing actually happening to the sound here, but I've drawn in this kind of blue line. So you can see the difference in amplitude in those notes. And let me actually play it again, soloed kick and bass, so you can like get a better grasp of what's happening there. You get this kind of like almost stuttery groove in the, the sort of low end frequency of the sound. Some notes sound a little bit boomier than others. Um, and some notes are kind of hitting a little bit harder than others. And a compressor is a really good tool to kind of control that instability of the sound because it basically works on your kind of dynamic range. So essentially in traditional recording, a compressor was designed to work on the overall levels of a sound. You know, say for example, you've got a drummer playing in a verse section and then it comes into a chorus and he suddenly gets a lot louder. You know, in the actual final mix and final recording of the sound, you don't essentially want that drum sound to suddenly get much louder in the chorus. You may want the kind of energetic feel of the sound, but no difference in amplitude. So a compressor was used to even out the overall amplitude of a sound in traditional recording. But it's also very helpful in these kind of like electronic music situations. Um, I guess when you've got control over the source of the sound, you can go in and edit the amplitudes one by one. But, you know, like I said, I recorded this from a hardware synth, so I didn't have that much control. But at the same time, using a little bit of compression here and there, you know, if you can pick up first that the sound needs it, can definitely uh, can definitely improve the overall kind of stability of, of uh, a bass sound. So this is the Flux Studio Sessions Pure Compressor. Reason I really enjoy using this is it's got this kind of like A-B setting over here. So you can, for example, set up a sound and then, you know, A-B it between, you know, it's in it patch or a different patch. And say, for example, you kind of overdone it a little bit, then you can kind of mix in between the A and B. So this is a very, very powerful workflow tool. And I'm going to show you guys kind of uh, what I'm talking about. So as you see, you, you get the ability to kind of like mix it and, you know, test how it sounds between these different settings. Um, I mean, you could just bypass it and unbypass it. But now I feel that, you know, for example, here, um, let's say we're not 100% happy with how we've kind of tweaked it, but we want a kind of fallback. What you can do is you can kind of click this copy A button and it copies your settings from A to B. So now we can go and tweak a little bit and, you know, A, B between what we had before 
and our new setting over here. So let's say for example play with the attack and release settings over here and you know if we get to a point where we're not too happy we can go back to A, A, B, test them um, or you know worst comes to worst copy it back over. Cool, so that already sounds a lot more kind of stable. I mean, looking at the LFO tool, like I said, there are those kind of slight inconsistencies, but you know, I think with the analog synth, you're never gonna get 100% away from those slight inconsistencies, but I kind of like the kind of characteristic that that imparts. And I think we've done a pretty decent job of making it sound stable uh, within the bounds of what we had to work with. Um, so bear in mind, you don't necessarily have to use such a complex compressor as um, this pure compressor, I actually want to show you guys a couple of techniques using a, a Cubase's built-in compressor that you can apply to pretty much any compressor to get uh, pretty good results quickly. Um, but again, like I said, the compressor is something that you kind of want to assess first. You know, do you need this? Um, then only if you feel you 100% necessarily need it, then apply the steps that I'm going to show you guys just now. So also, I generally, once I've com kind of compressed the bass and stuff like that, I will go back to my sidechain settings and maybe alter those a little bit because what happens here is, you know, we've kind of evened out the amplitude of all three of those rolling bass notes. Um, I mean, I've still got my comp uh, sidechain, you know, after that, but sometimes it kind of ends up being a little bit too loud and overlays with the kick. Um, I'm not sure if you guys were picking that up over there. But I will often then go back to my sidechain settings, um, play with these a little bit to kind of get a more desired effect overall. Okay, I really like what I've done with that uh, bass compression, so I'm not going to change that. I'm actually going to do show you guys uh, this kind of uh, approach that I usually take, uh, or steps that I usually take with compression. Um, but I'm going to show you guys on a percussion group. So here, for example, um, what I want to do is kind of overall the, um, I kind of want to create a kind of similarity between the transient peaks on all of these percussions. I feel like um, they're a little bit too varying and I want to create a kind of more similar sound on each of them. And using group compression, using compression on a group is a really cool way of doing that. So what I actually want to do is let's just solo this quickly. So 
So I feel like the kind of hats are a little bit too open and the snares a little bit kind of too sharp. I kind of want to bring them all together. Um, so, you know, like I mentioned earlier, actually going into the source sounds and editing them one by one could be a lot more powerful. You know, you've got the ability to kind of change them on a hit by hit basis. But I'm just using this to kind of show you guys the idea um, that I use when I'm approaching uh, compression. So, so let's open up Cubase's built-in uh, compressor over here. So the idea is to set it up so that you're kind of very much overdoing it. I want to turn this threshold kind of all the way down, ratio all the way down, turn automatic makeup off, and then turn the makeup gain up quite a bit. Um, you know, you obviously don't want to blow your speakers, so I'm going to turn it up while it's playing. Um, and then what we want to do is we want to apply a, a couple of steps. So this is kind of the setup for it. So this isn't part of the steps, I guess. But then, you know, making it easier to remember the steps are basically, or how I like to remember it is A-R-R-T, art. Attack, release, ratio, threshold, in that order. And I find doing it in that order, you kind of get the most out of compression. You know, you kind of hear the envelope of the compression before dialing in the kind of ratio and threshold, which are going to uh, sort of reduce how audible that compression actually is, if that makes sense. So we're overdoing it now so we can really hear what's happening with the attack and release while we tweak them. And then once we've tweaked those to perfection, we move on to RT, which is ratio and threshold. So cool. Let's play the sound and I'm going to turn up the makeup so we can really hear what's going on. And I kind of want to create a kind of uh, overall uh, envelope for my entire percussions group. So the attack is essentially the amount of time that it takes for the compressor to start working. So what we're doing there is we're kind of isolating the transient before the compressor hits in to reduce that overall volume of the sound. So you can use this attack. Um, Cubase's a, a compressor actually has a hold, which is pretty cool. Um, that kind of elongates that. But for percussive stuff, I don't end up using that too much. Um, and then the release is how much time it takes to then go back to zero gain reduction. Um, I guess in this example, there's kind of always sounds going. So there was never going to be a point where it hits zero again. But what I like to do is play with these attack and release until I get like a really groovy sound, but that it almost sounds like all those transients are kind of coming from the same spot, if that makes sense. Cool, that's kind of got like a nice groove going to it. So obviously it's way extreme. So this is where we start dialing it back a bit. First starting off with the ratio and then the threshold um, until we kind of get our desired effect. You know, in the example that we heard right now, the snare was kind of way too squashed and the hi-hats weren't ringing out a bit and the hi-hats kind of weren't ringing out enough. So we want to kind of reduce these settings until we kind of mix between that extreme and the not so extreme kind of sound. But you want to make sure that you turn your makeup gain down here first and then reduce these uh, settings and then dial it back in again as you want.
cool. So let's look at another example. Um, this kind of op lead, um, I actually discussed this in a previous tutorial. This guy kind of starts quite low on the filter and, you know, builds and builds and builds and gets to a point where, you know, the volume actually gets quite loud in the synth. So let's actually just solo it. So it kind of gets louder over time and and compressor in its kind of like traditional form, this is kind of how it was designed to be used to, you know, to kind of even, even out the overall uh, volume of a sound. So what I like to do is let's actually just uh, remove this and I'll go for like the middle section and see uh, what sort of volume it is at that point or, you know, find the, the part where it sounds like it's most uh, sort of even, I guess, in terms of the volume. So let's just say around minus 18. So what we can do is we can actually automatically set the threshold to minus 18 and turn the ratio like all the way up. Um, and then, you know, start to dial it back from there. So because this is not a limiter, um, I think you can actually set it to limit over there. Um, the ratio doesn't go like all the way to infinite. So I don't want that kind of really hard limiting effect happening on the synth. So what we can do is we can actually reduce the threshold so that it starts triggering at a lower volume. Let's say something like minus 22. So that our overall kind of output volume at its loudest point would be something like minus 18, which is what we wanted originally. Cool, I feel like we haven't affected the kind of dynamics and the transients of the sound there too much. I guess it was um, already quite processed and stuff, so we don't have to jump in and uh, edit those attack and release, I think, too much on this compression. But I generally like to listen to how it sounds, you know, mixed in with the track as well. Um, I'll end up doing my overall volume mixing after I'm done with all the compression and stuff like that anyway. So I'm not going to worry too much about the volume of the sound now, but let's just hear how it kind of sounds you know, over time, does it get too much, too loud or too soft, etc., etc. So let's look at more creative examples of compression as opposed to corrective compression. So stuff like uh, Serum's multiband compressor, um, as you guys know, I've used it quite a bit. It's got a very particular character. And so I would kind of consider that as creative compression because you're kind of using it for a particular sound, so to speak. Um, let me just give you a quick example. So um, again, I'm just going to use the percussion group here. Um, just because there's a couple of tricks that I want to show you uh, in a moment that kind of focus in on the percussion group. But um, just for this, let's uh, say, for example, let's say, for example, add uh, the serum effects here, just so I can show you uh, what I'm talking about in terms of like the particular character that it's got. 
So for those who don't know, the multiband compressor in Serum is kind of like an emulation of Ableton's OTT compressor setting. Um, and OTT does stand for over the top, as far as I know, um, and it's known to be like a very particularly characterful sound. Um, so what I'm going to do is let's actually just play the percussion group and I'm going to bypass it and we're going to listen to like the character that it's got so I can kind of show you guys what I'm talking about. So it's like a particularly kind of sharp, distorted sound. Not the kind of thing that I would, put, um, not the kind of thing that I would use if I'm looking for like a clean compression or something like that. That being said, is it's very nice on synth sounds and stuff like that because it kind of does add this slight saturation character to the sound. Um, similarly to stuff like uh, tube compressors and stuff like that, I would cons uh, consider those generally uh, more creative styles of compression. Anything which has a particular sound, you know. Um, that I wouldn't technically use in mixing specifically for electronic music because we're creating the sound using the synths and the compression is essentially either being used to create the sound or fix the sound and that's how I would kind of class the two. So <clears throat> hopefully that outlines it a little bit for you guys. Now I'm going to show you guys a little trick that's really really cool on percussion groups. And this trick is generally known as parallel compression. And the idea is to have a compressor that's either kind of like a dry, wet kind of situation going on. But I personally don't like using a dry, wet setting um, because you don't have control over like pre and post EQ and stuff like that as you would using it in a send return like I outlined in my video on reverb and delay and stuff like that. So here what I've done is I've set up a send channel on this percussions group and I've set it up to pre-fader so that I can you know solo the two and listen to you know this in isolation and I've sent this to this channel over here parallel comp and what I've done here is I've created some distortion and then a Cubase's tube compressor and I've really overdriven the input and then played with these kind of attack and release so what we're going to do here is let me actually just show you a quick example um, of what it sounds like. So generally speaking, I end up then turning this channel down a little bit and then mixing them in again. <clears throat> but this is kind of what it sounds like. So this is without parallel compression. And this is with that parallel compression and slight saturation. Um, so just so you guys can get a reference of what it sounds like, um, I'm actually going to mute this percussion channel and so we can hear the parallel compression soloed. So what I'm doing is I'm kind of just creating this like percussive drive element that I'm like layering over the original sound and then I'm kind of using this EQ to carve out a specific like tone so it doesn't get like too overbearing in the high frequencies um, and stuff like that. So here this is what it would sound like you know using it without any of the EQ and stuff like that or you know a traditional kind of like dry wet scenario. So as you can see, you know, using it with a, you know, send channel and having the advantage of being able to, you know, apply these EQs and stuff to really clean up the sound afterwards um, and like place it in the mix really does help. So what I actually want to do is let's just play it, you know, the entire track um, and I'll show you with and without and stuff. So 
So the key then is to kind of like blend these two channels in, you know, the parallel compression and the percussion so that you don't have too much of that kind of like clicky percussive transient, but you kind of just use it to add energy to uh, the kind of percussion mix. So this really helps if you've got, say for example, um, you know, very bare percussion part where you don't have much going on. Um, it kind of still adds that energy to the kind of bare sound. And then when the sort of main elements start to come in, it doesn't sound, you know, all that totally different because you've kind of contained a kind of dynamic space for the kind of percussions to work, um, if that makes sense, due to like the uh, uh, compression that we did earlier, as well as this kind of like added uh, transient effect using the parallel compression. So I'm gonna just skip through a couple of these parts so you can hear kind of what I'm talking about. Awesome. I hope that kind of outlines how I uh, approach compression in various different ways. Um, you know, like I said, there's kind of two different ways to compression. If I'm going for a corrective type of compression, it definitely helps to assess what you actually want to do with the compressor before opening it up and before diving in with it. Um, unlike EQ, where you can actually use the EQ to find your sort of settings and stuff like that. Um, Compressor is very different in that I feel that it's not necessary on every track. You know, if you can clean it up in the source, then it's probably going to benefit the overall dynamics of the track. Um, that being said, in a sort of creative sense, compression can be used uh, quite effectively to kind of bring out detail and transience in certain elements. It can also cause too much transience to come through or, you know, it can create a little bit too much saturation on certain things which you may not want. So yeah, I hope that outlines it for you guys. Let me know what you think in the comments. If there's ways that you guys use compression that I maybe sort of didn't outline in the video, then also let me know in the comments and maybe I'll try to address those in future episodes. A big thanks to IDM Mag, proud supporters of the dance music scene and my channel. So yeah, as always, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. See you guys next time.